You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dodge Movie Podcast. This is episode 106, closing out the month of February and our four films for you to try to figure out what the theme of February is. Get those guesses in and we will announce the winners. I'm being positive because so far we have one winner, but I anticipate some more. So get those guesses in so you can be included in all of the shout outs and and get to choose a movie for next year. So that's, I, I think, a big we we keep getting people suggesting movies to us. Here is your chance to be responsible for one of our episodes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Today we are talking about The Big Sick that came out in 2017. We watched it for free with our Prime subscription and it stars Kumail Nanjani, Zoe Kazan, Holly Hunter, Ray Romano, Bo Burnham, A.D. Bryant, Kurt Braunholer, and David Allen Greer. Quite the comedians in this one. Michael Showalter is the director and he is responsible for spoiler alert that I just watched this last weekend. I love that for you. The dropout, the shrink next door and the eyes of Tammy Faye. Is Showalter wet hot American summer? Yes. Okay. The DP for this film is Brian Bergion and he did cake in 2017 and he also did spoiler alert. So directors they like and, to work together. Yes. And the lovebirds from 2020. Which also is Kumail, right? Yes. Issa Rae, I thought. Yes, 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 yes. And and Kumail Nanjani and his real life wife, Emily V. Gordon, were the writers for this film. And this film was shot in and around Chicago. The synopsis for this film is Pakistan-born comedian Kumail Nanjani and grad student Emily Gardner fall in love, but struggles as their cultures clash. When Emily contracts a mysterious illness, Kumail finds himself forced to face her feisty parents. Wow. Alliteration much? And his family's expectations and his true feelings. Holy cow. Somebody Lots of... Was, somebody was exercising their uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> writing muscle in that yeah. one. Got a thesaurus for their birthday. Yeah. Uh, the tagline for this one is an awkward true story. What do you think? Super descriptively accurate, but, but not... Kinda, yeah, yeah, it not, doesn't really no make, sizzle. Yeah, it doesn't make me. Oh, well, let me go out and watch this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the guy who doesn't say he wants to drink booze. He says like C H five O H or whatever ethanol formula is. That's what it's like. <laughs> right. Totally, completely accurate and boring. I like this little bit of trivia. The film was released in the United States on Kumail and Emily's tenth wedding anniversary, which is sweet. Yeah, it was funny. I just watched in doing some research, a clip of them. And she said something about this is so exciting. Like people are going to see our movie. And he said, nobody's going to see this movie. This is our 10th anniversary present to one another. Like he just had <laughs> no hopes. And it was a huge hit. Spoiler alert for right. the uh, numbers. But oh, by the way, I got to say, before all the chemistry nerds, write in and yell at me. I have no <laughs> idea what the actual chemical formula for alcohol is, but you can tell me, but don't, don't make fun of me because I don't know what I'm talking I made up some letters. And when you um, write in to tell him, make a guess of what the theme is. Yes. <laughs> it could be movies about booze. You don't know. You don't know. You did talk about that last week. So there's, yeah, Let's lots see. of alcohol. I just want to say before you read your pickup line, that Kumail Nanjani personally contacted Anupam Kher about taking the role of his father, Asma. Kher accepted the role after learning that Nanjani's real father personally expressed a desire for him to take the role. Right. Wow. Isn't that sweet? That is sweet. That would be hard. That'd be a lot of pressure that this person personally picked you out and, right. and now you have to portray them. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I was trying to think of who, who I wanted to, to portray, to portray me. And, and, and I, I think for pure accuracy, of course, we'd have to go with John Cena. <laughs> you know, similar build. No, who's the one everybody says? Well, 
Um, I think Michael Chiklis yeah. is probably who you would cast if you're a <laughs> casting director. Yeah. And I'm sorry for that, Mr. Chiklis. That's Please don't was, hold that against me. That's what I was thinking. All right. Kick us off with your pickup line. Okay. There's actually two here. First, we hear the first dialogue we hear. This is off screen, and I don't always count that. But it's uh, the MC, probably David Allen Greer, saying, keep it going for the next performer, my man, Kumail Nanjani, which actually describes the film. Mm -hmm. But then the actual line of dialogue from Kumail is, hello, I'll tell you about myself, mm -hmm. which is also accurate. Yeah, very accurate. This is a great movie, and I'm partial because I love movies. Uh, I mean, well, I love comedians to begin with, but then movies about their life, and I I. I appreciate how they got a bunch of other comedians like 80 and Bo. And, yeah, and Bo Burnham and, and Braun Holler. Or Braun Holler, yeah. Yeah, because it just gives an air of reality. Yeah, I don't think actors can be comics. Like, you have to get no. a comic to play a comic. Yeah, and I hate it when they write jokes for him, but this one felt like they let the comedians just go, and I think Kumail probably yeah. has that sensibility, so he probably advocated for that. And the only, I just want to say... I was so excited for the punchline as a, a teenager, and, and that one kind of did disappoint. Sally Field and Tom Hanks, yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't was as good as we wanted. Nope. So one thing I noticed that says to me that this is a film by comics is comics love bombing. <laughs> no, they don't love <laughs> well, to don't bomb themselves, they, no. but they love the, 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 the event of someone bombing horribly. So there's a part when Kumail's gotten some bad news, and so his big break stand-up performance is a disaster. And realistically, the other comics love, they enjoyed watching him fail, and they enjoyed bringing it up and talking about it. And I had a note in here, which I didn't actually catch until I reread it right now, is why does the audience need to see his horrible one-man show? And I realized it's because comics love bombing. They love watching him <laughs> bomb in that one man show. That's part of it. That's the whole shtick. <laughs> and he kind of bombs with her parents too, now that I think mm -hmm. about it. I was going to say, I think the thing that, that adds so much comedy to this is, which is a really, they ride a fine line. And I've, I've been watching some YouTube videos and they talk about it. Like, how can we go from this very serious you know, most parents, if you hear your child's in the hospital and then you hear that they've been put in a coma and you didn't get to make that decision and then what's going to happen to them. And you you know that this person was dating your child, but now, you know, has decided not to. And so, you know, there's going to be a little bit of animosity. But what they did so well is they rode this line of awkward, especially Ray Romano. And I think that's a lot to do with his acting, but also his the lines that he had to deliver. But he's so, 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 so good at at doing that awkward thing. And and to me, the scene that most epitomizes, well, there's two. One in the hospital cafeteria when he <laughs> awkwardly brings up 9-11. Okay. I have to say, yeah. credit to Kamel. Yeah. That joke... Of it was a terrible tragedy. We lost nineteen of our best guys that day. <laughs> that is so funny. It was so off the cuff too. And Cause... and and it's so, because it's so inappropriate. And that reminds me. And I think I've told this on the podcast. So I'll try to be quick about when I was a kid and George Nishida told the joke when I got the the kite that had the Marines raising the flag on Iwo Jima because he was a Japanese American, he said, hey, we lost that one. Again, I thought that was hilarious. I was 12, <laughs> and that is my sense of humor, that incredibly over-the-top inappropriate joke. I mm -hmm. loved that we lost 19 of our best guys that day. That was... Delivered so earnestly. Oh, too. yeah. It was really funny. And then the second time is he and Kumail are in the same room sleeping, but one is on the floor, and Kumail's, I think, up in the bed. Ray is on the floor. And he starts talking about love <laughs> and, and he, and he says something like, well, that's why it's so scary. That's why they call it love or something. And Camille goes, I don't understand that. And he goes, yeah, I just started talking and I was hoping that it would kind of. <laughs> <Yeah. mix." laughs> and at one point Ray says out loud, it sounds stupid. And I was like, oh, that is perfect. Right. Cause he pauses out loud pause it sounds stupid <laughs> <laughs> like yeah it does and he just 
he's not, they don't paint him as inept. No. But they definitely paint him almost as the yin to Holly Hunter's yang. And she's very much the Shirley MacLaine from Terms of Endearment. She is. I haven't seen that film, but I get the reference. Yes. She is just, you know, a dog after a bone. You are going to take care of my child. We're going to put her in the best hospital. And if this one isn't it, then we're going to move her and like. She is her child's best advocate. And I think Ray is kind of like, let's just walk down and get them all kind of attitude. He's not that he doesn't want to take care of his daughter, but he just does it in a different way than his wife does. Yeah, I I think Holly Hunter's character and I are are the ones who are going to lock and load and drive the Suburban through the front doors to break our our child out of the hospital. I get that. that, But I think what I really liked about the writing and filmmaking of this is how we see that when we first meet them, their characters, they're united, which you would be. Your daughter's been put in a coma. This is a big deal. But then we start to see the cracks showing. And then that relationship kind of unfolds over the film, which in some sense in Ray's awkwardness as well, but it it allows Kumail to kind of fix his relationship with Emily. Right. As well. So I thought that was I love that progressive disclosure. There wasn't like a real big moment where they immediately start fighting. It was like as things had gone on and you could see that they're being worn down. And then I loved the writing of the line, like where they're in the hospital and they're arguing. I think it was about whether to move her. And Holly Hunter's character says something about him and he's like oh okay the greatest hits i can play this one back from memory and so it was like ray says that yeah ray's character so you can know that they've gone down this or they've had this fight many many times and he's sick of it yeah so i like i thought that was super realistic but really well done right and I, i i didn't even think of this until i was watching some of the clips and and showalter was talking about how do we get the three of them out of the hospital because as the parent you wouldn't want to leave you do not want to leave your children your child's side if they're in the hospital Mm. but in order to have them you know like why would the parents go to a comedy show you know like why would they go out for dinner why would they go stay at her apartment are you asking me to answer that no 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 (laughs) sorry okay (laughs) no and so they said and emily herself the real Emily said, because part of when someone is in a coma, life goes on. Right. And so it's not that they were, any of them were being disrespectful, but he had to do a show that night. And if he didn't do that show and it would help the parents just get their mind off of it. Like, and so I thought it was really creative how they worked over this and they realized that we need to figure out a way to get them out of the hospital. So it's not a movie set you know like a bottle up for two hours right. we're in this hospital room uh, yeah and i thought they did a good job because i never once went wait why do they right. leave horrible filmmaking to put people in one location for the entire film <laughs> if it's only a 12 minute film it's okay okay <laughs> um so i liked the dialogue of ray when they're at the comedy club and holly hunter picks a fight with the frat boy and ray's little fit as he was leaving i thought was so poignantly accurate that He really isn't the kind of person who gets in fights in bars, but he's just got this, this like powers, powerlessness that is fueling him. And he says, I'm like, I've got levels or something. He just really dumb, dorky, (laughs) not at all threatening Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But you could tell good acting on Romano's part Mm -hmm. that there's an emotion there that he's just kind of venting. Yeah. And then. Camille's family. And this is the other thing that I appreciated that they didn't do. They didn't make them the like cold immigrant, stereotypical East Indian, you know, Pakistan, Pakistani family. They made them a very dynamic, like parents want the best for their kids. And mothers usually are a little more picky about that. And the father's a little bit more easygoing and the brother is going to poke fun. And right. They made them still a loving family while showing that no, but the mom wants him to marry a, a good girl. Right. Which is, I think, realistic, but also wrong. But that's something that I think families from that culture are struggling with as their children grow up and have love matches. 
it's like a culture clash, right? But I, I think it was summed up by this great line when uh, Kamel is leaving for New York and his father has come by and as a touching moment, his mother made his favorite food, but she refuses to talk to him. Mm-hmm. And the father says, to be clear, you are still not a part of this family, but call us when you get there, right? And I thought that really well captured this kind of, uh, uh, th- this tension that Kamel's character talked about, and I'm sure he probably felt as as a real person, between like the tradition and the do what your parents want and all of that, and then actual life and, you know. So it's, it's complicated, and I thought they ca- captured it well. They very much did. And in one of the interviews, they talked about how both of their families had a nickname for oh. each other. And they weren't maybe the most appropriate, <laughs> but her family, his family called Emily Fair and Light. There was a product, a skin lightening product, <laughs> and it maybe it was called Fair and Light or that was the tagline. So I can't remember if they called I think they called her Miss Fair and Light. And so and I wish I could remember what and they both Emily and Kumail didn't take offense to it. They realized it was how the family members, each of them, because they both did it, were trying to kind of wrap their brains around. We're not going to have a daughter or son in law like we thought, but I think they could see how much the two loved one another and they weren't going to stand in the way. And, you know, they you ultimately you want your kid to be happy. And when you see them happy, then you make peace with, okay, this isn't what I thought it was going to be, but I'm just going to be happy about it. So anyway, Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. And I thought that the film did a good job in talking about this cultural difference that we've got to kind of, and I think that happens in anything. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, how we do our holidays and, and how our kids' spouse does their holidays is going to be different. Every family has their own culture, but it is probably much more dramatic and more, I don't know what the word is, obvious or whatever, when it's two different cultures. And that's, I think, the again, the tension of immigrant families is that that tension, right, of inserting into this new culture, but it's made even more, I don't know, I want to say worse, but more of an issue when you marry into mm-hmm. it. Right. And at one point, Kumail says something like, why, why did, you know, if you moved here, why don't, why are you still trying to be like it's in Pakistan? Right. And I don't think his parents are wrong for that. I think that is the challenge of all immigrants. And I like that his parents were, they kind of never softened. Right. Again, the Hollywood thing would be to have them be like, oh, Emily's so cool. I guess we were wrong all along. Right. And his mom was like, no, you should marry a good Pakistani girl. I brought 25 of them by the house. Come on. Yeah, I have that. That was a montage of all the women that came by. (laughs) Yeah. And I love how proud Kumail is of Pakistan throughout the whole film. He's always saying like, well, in Pakistan and different things like he's definitely assimilated. And there's that funny scene with him and his brother when his brother says out loud, like, you're dating a white woman and (laughs) this white family turns and looks and he's like you know we love white people we're not we hate the terrorists or something (laughs) and so it's it's very funny how he kind of handles it but i just it's so sweet because i just noticed in this viewing how many times he says well in pakistan or you know and and kind of he's sharing his culture with emily and so he's talking about how it works over there right and she has a funny line after the one man show, something to like, I, I, I didn't know where you were from or something like that. Right. We're right. kind of making fun of him. Yeah. So was there anything else like in the cinematography of this film? I didn't know this. I don't have any notes because it just it was kind of like just true to what it would be. I didn't notice any like swinging for the fences scene. Right. So. This is maybe more title sequence than cinematography, but I liked how they opened with actual snapshots of Kumail. Mm -hmm. That was cute. Mm -hmm. Right early on, they have a walk and talk backstage at the comedy club. And that was maybe a a nod to the West Wing. I don't know, but it was a pretty long steady cam walk and talk. I did notice, speaking of cinematography, though, backstage at comedy clubs is very challenging because all the black walls. Mm -hmm. So getting that lit and exposed properly was probably a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. 
there's a fair number of shots in cars, and those are pretty stable. So I, I'm not sure how they did that, if they did process track or if they like actually mounted, like with <laughs> screwed the, the, the camera mount to the hood or something. But it was nice, stable footage. I felt like there were a couple, I was like, oh, that was done on a set. Yeah, it could be. With a green could screen. Be, yeah. Any other writing notes? I will say, from a safety perspective, I want to say too much food and drink all around the Mac when when uh, Holly Hunter was having the munchies and then looking at stuff made me a little nervous. But early on, you just don't see a lot of that, I got to take a dookie humor anymore. That was a non-trivial plot point. You just don't see number two based humor so much. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to follow that up. So yeah, I'm just, there is this, no way to follow no that. There's no segue here. Under sets, I thought it was hilarious. And I know you noted this too in the trivia that Zoe Kazan admitted on the late show with Stephen Colbert that she fell asleep so, during some of the scenes where she was supposed to be in a coma and was eventually her, her little naps were ruined <laughs> when she woke up during the middle of takes yeah. or the takes were ruined when she woke up. Yeah. It'd be funny if she, uh... Woke up like a cougar. Ah! <laughs> right. Okay. Was there any head trauma in this film? There's, I guess you would call it a narrative head trauma storytelling. When Terry tells a story about like hopscotch or something, some kid Jimmy gets hit in the head with a piece of chalk. <laughs> That's kind of the point of the story. He gets right. hit in the head. And that was it. That's all the head trauma I've got. All right. Did we get a smoochie in this romance? Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. We do have that Camille kisses Emily during when they're trying to watch The Walking Dead. That's kind of, they jump each other's bones. And then there's an implied one when she comes over again, they're watching a movie. But after all of that, by the end of the film, no extra smoochies. Well, it was very uncomfortable for Kumail to be kissing another woman in front of his real wife and calling her Emily. So I think maybe he put the kibosh on a couple of them. Right. I think, to be fair, maybe Emily should have kissed Zoe Kazan and, and made, made like, yeah, everybody's kissing her. Oh, it's you like mean normal. off screen, off screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just on set, just to kind of break the ice. Yeah. The real Emily said it was just awkward because when they were filming those scenes, she went out of eye shot of Kumail because he requested sure. that. And the crew kept looking at her as they were kissing, like waiting for a reaction. And so she just felt really awkward. Like she gave him a thumbs up, but she was just like, what, what do you want from me? Right. I would say maybe turn around or just like, yeah, go around the corner or something. <laughs> she didn't care. So it was Kumail who cared. Right. How about a driving review? You mentioned driving. So he drives a 2005 Toyota Corolla and it looks like it says, I'm really broke. Like, he's so broke, he couldn't even afford a Prius to be an Uber. So, <laughs> But I have to say, when they're getting ready to go to New York, Bo and AD and him, that was a really nice Subaru wagon for a comic. I don't know where they got that one. Maybe they rented it. Oh, there you go. They rented it. That makes more sense. All right. So we go to the numbers. Let's go to the numbers. Okay, right before we do that, I'm just going to give you this little tidbit. While searching for funding, the producer submitted the script to a variety of potential studios. Within three hours of submission, Film Nation made an offer to fund the whole movie, no strings attached. So that's, a, that's you know, what every filmmaker wants to hear. Totally. Although I think they should have had a string attached that Camille would come over and do their son's bar mitzvah. <laughs> okay. This film, which came out uh, just about five years ago in 2017, I guess six years ago now. The budget was $5 million and domestically it made 42.8 million dollars which is 11.4 times the budget good job camille big success big huge all right worldwide it made 56.8 million dollars got a 7.5 out of 10 on imdb critics absolutely loved this movie it almost got a perfect score at 98 percent audiences were a little cooler at 88 percent, but still that's definitely a win they loved it too it is right dead on two hours. It is rated R, probably for some language, and it is listed as a comedy, drama, romance. Apatow Productions and Film Nation Entertainment are the studios that put it out. I think I said this before, but it was filmed in Chicago and it was a huge award winner. I am not going to be able to name them all, but I will let you know that it was nominated for Best Screenplay, Holly Hunter was nominated for a SAG Award and an AARP Award. 
woo, woo, it won the AFI for Movie of the Year and many, many, many other wins and nominations. So this was a big movie that year. Rightfully so. This is, I was very excited when I saw that Camille had a movie coming out and I think it lived up to it. Mm-hmm. It was good. It was a fun one. Not one I minded watching again. And I, this is probably at least my third or fourth viewing. Right. So. Oh, and uh, again, to extend the invitation, if Camille would like to come on the show, we'd be happy to have her. <laughs> Absolutely. And Emily. And Emily. I want to chat with oh, Emily. I, I mean, maybe we could do a month of Pakistani movies. There you go. I'm down. Okay. Hey, text us your guess. You have two days left to guess the theme. So text it. Text or call to 971-245-4148 and let us know what you think these last four movies have in common. Come on, guys. This was a layup. But never forget. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 